and jump right into the next section. Um, I said there wouldn't be homework on this section. That's still true. I mean, when I finish this, I think you'll see why. It's really short and is mainly just one or two definitions. So we have functions. We've all seen functions before. The math majors in the room have seen functions a lot. The science majors has maybe seen functions less, but just as a quick reminder, a function is a rule that uniquely assigns outputs to inputs. So for example, You can have the squaring function that takes a number as its input and squares it. Or you could have a square root function that takes a number as its input and gives you the square root. Although you'll notice that if we're working purely with real numbers, the square root function will sometimes break. If you give it a negative number as its input, it won't be able to do anything with it. Um, we're going to take this definition and we are going to, I mean, we're going to import it unchanged into linear algebra. But in, you know, for the functions we're used to, I mean, maybe in, in calculus three, you see functions from R3 to R3 and so on. But I mean, the functions we're used to, most used to, take numbers and assign them to other numbers. In linear algebra, we'll have functions that take vectors and assign them to other vectors. And Although you can use the word function if you want to, it's perfectly correct. It's most common to refer to functions as transformations in linear algebra. So a function or transformation from Rn to Rm, and this is not a typo, those uh, that n and that m are supposed to be different, is a rule that takes vectors in R n and uniquely assigns them to vectors in R M. So, for example, well, let me make sure everyone 
has this written down. We could have a snipping function from R3 to R2. And what this function might do is take a vector A, B, C and just snip off that last entry to give us the vector a, b. So, you know, 1, 4, negative 7 gets uniquely mapped to 1, 4. Or maybe you want to go the other way and define a buffering function. Like if any of you do programming at all, coding at all, um, you know you run into this situation where you start by, you know, you have, you're going to get a list of numbers and you start with one number and you're going through some kind of for loop and it's generating the list of numbers as you go. And what can sometimes be helpful for speed and memory purposes is if you pre-allocate the list. So if you start with this list that just contains a bunch of zeros, and then as you go, you replace the zeros with the actual number you're interested in. So maybe... We define a function that goes from R2, maybe ahead of, um, ahead of time, we know that our list is going to have 10 elements in it. And this function just takes two initial conditions and then buffers it with three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Buffers it with eight zeros to make ten entries in all. Or going back to something we've already seen, we can use. Um, matrices to define functions. And this is a big one. I would say that this is the big one. If we have an M by N matrix times an N by one vector, The result is m by 1. And you can use this to define a function from Rn to Rm. And because we frequently call functions transformations, We'll use T instead of F, but otherwise our notation is the same. We can define a function or a transformation um, by taking X and multiplying it by A. So, a few definitions. Um, we've got a function or a transformation 
from R N to R M. And these definitions will be familiar, or at least you've you've seen them at some point. R N will be called the domain. And when we're working with these transformations in linear algebra, um, I mean, the I'm trying to figure out how to say this. Every vector in Rn will always give an output if Rn is the domain. Like, going back to college algebra, The square root function is a function from R to R, from the real numbers to the real numbers, but it's not defined for every real number. It's not defined for negative numbers. We don't have that here. If we have a transformation from Rn to Rm, it's going to be defined for every value in Rn. So you might think domain and range, but you'd be incorrect, domain and codomain. That's a word that maybe gets introduced, I don't know, in calculus, maybe, and then not used a lot. But um, we've got the domain, we've got the codomain, and unlike the codomain is different from the domain, because we've got the domain, Every vector in the domain is mapped to something. And that something is contained in Rm, but it might be smaller than Rm. Like here. Our codomain is R10. But there are vectors in R10 that are just never mapped to by this function. I mean, in particular, any vector that has anything other than zero in its third through eight through tenths entry. So, the range is the values in R M that are actually mapped to. So if here's R M and here's Rn, the values in Rn are sent to the range, which is living inside the codomain. And now, um, these are all at least potentially review. I mean, I, I don't, not 100% certain you'll have seen the word codomain before, but you might have. Uh, probably a new definition. A trans. Formation T is called linear if for 
for all vectors v and w and all scalars alpha, the transformation of V plus W is the transformation of V plus the transformation of W. And the transformation of a scalar times a vector is the scalar times the transformation of the vector. And this is quite a special condition. I mean, if you think of, you know, the functions we're used to working with, the functions from R to R, I mean, pretty much none of those satisfy this condition. Like, exponential functions aren't linear. Um, logarithmic functions aren't linear. Um, linear functions aren't linear, which is a kind of weird bit of uh, terminology. But in linear algebra, we have seen a type of transformation that is linear. We have seen, in fact, the prototypical example of a linear transformation. And that is when we use a matrix to define a transformation. T of V plus W is A times V plus W that multiplication distributes over this addition a times V is T of V. A times W is T of W. T of alpha V is A times alpha V is A times A times V. We can move scalars around. Is alpha times T of V. And because apparently I'm not very fast on the update, on the uptake, I finally realized, like just now, after teaching this class for six semesters, um, when we first define a matrix times a vector, we say, well, matrix vector multiplication might not be totally natural, but it does have two conditions. It distributes over addition, and we can move scalars around and after six years of this, I just made the connection that the reason the textbook isolates those conditions in particular and puts them in a little box 
is that they are this linearity statement. They're exactly the conditions we need for matrix vector multiplication to be linear. And I believe that's it for section 1.8. Um, we still have stuff to say about linearity. There are two linearity sections. They probably could have been combined into one, but whatever. I like our textbook. It can do stuff like this occasionally, and it doesn't bother me. Um, but the homework on linearity will come after we finish linearity. So that's why I said we wouldn't have any homework on this section. We'll finish linearity Tuesday and there will be homework then. And I will see you Tuesday. Enjoy the